sound check. I know that I'm, you know, I'm one of the three last presentations before beer 30, so I, I <laughs> promise I will be brief, brief and be brilliant and probably be, good, be gone. But can you hear me in the back row okay so I don't have to use a microphone? Thank you. So, uh, what I want to chat with you about is really a, it's a briefing, um, more about the kinds of data that's available uh, for HCA determination and verification. So it's really not so much about oblique uh, imagery, although there'll be some conversations obviously about that since I do represent photometry. But these are the things that I really want to I talk about uh, in, in, our, in our time together. So I am going to spend a little bit of time talking about this metric oblique because in, in my world, that is something that has a tremendous amount of value as we talk about HCA uh, determination and verification. We'll cycle back and look a little bit about some of the key uh, general things that most of you look forward in, in terms of your own HCA management um, workflows. And then we'll talk uh, a little bit um, in more depth about what I've seen as kind of the, the common solution uh, for most operators uh, in the industry. So um, we're th I'm thinking of this as, as kind of a general briefing. And then we'll talk um, uh, a little bit about the use and the, the, the use and benefits of uh, different types of imagery, both orthogonal as well as oblique. The second to last point is, is probably the heart of, of what I, if there's anything that you take away from uh, our time together, it's the notion of the importance of having a primary data source. And I'll spend a little bit more time around that because this is really about being, being able to have a defensible position in terms of uh, the decisions that you make as, a, as an organization going forward and, and the importance of having such a data source in your possession. And then the last thing is, uh, if we have time, I'll show, share a specific use case. Um, and then the, the final point is when and if you decide to go down this path, if I've said something that triggers uh, some fascination and, and maybe a desire to, to move in that direction. I'll give you some kind of uh, uh, points of uh, reference or, or things to watch out for, things to consider as you look to, to find a vendor that might be able to help you along that path. So what is a metric oblique? Well, an oblique is obviously an, a, a high resolution aerial image that's shot from an angle. And in, in my world, it's about a 40 to 45 degree uh, uh, and, um, down, downward looking angle. And that allows you to, a number of things that, that are important, least of which is that now you're looking at the world from kind of a real world perspective. You're actually seeing the vertical surfaces. And in, in, in the world of metric obliques, they generally run, uh, when I said high resolution, it generally runs in the neighborhood of uh, somewhere from 12 inch on down to 3 inch. And, and if you, you hang on for a little while, maybe another year or two, we could be talking about stuff that's even sub uh, That technology is, is really coming forward. So this is re really a quick snapshot of the, the, the two major types of imagery that we in, in GIS generally deploy in, in, in the world today. The one is the orthogonal image, and obviously it's a, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful plan view. It's, it fits nicely in geospatial software. It plays very well because it's nice and rectangular. Then you got this weird little oblique image out there. And as you can see from the graphic, it isn't square. And so therefore, it has a hard time playing with geospatial software as, as we know it today. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that and, and how we overcome that. So you've got, you've got this nice square, high resolution uh, plan view, ortho image, and then you've got this weird little uh, trapezoidal image that allows you to kind of see vertical surfaces. In, in uh, a little bit about how we might capture these images, so in, in a pictometry conversation, uh, we have systems that allow us to capture those two types of images simultaneously. As that graphic showed, as we fly down a quarter in this example, we're, show, we're shooting not only that high resolution orthogonal image, but at the same time, we're shooting a high-resolution oblique forward-looking and a high-resolution uh, oblique rear-looking. And while the graphic showed that the plane kind of stops and steadies itself and then takes the picture, that doesn't really happen. <laughs> we actually do keep flying. Um, true story, uh, we have had people ask us that question. So I, I just want to clarify, that. don't stop. Uh, we do fly, because last time I looked, when you stop assessing it, it goes through. So, so 
we're, let's, let's kind of dig a little bit deeper into, into this notion of the different types of images. So in traditional um, aerial imagery, we, most of us have, have grown up on a, a high resolution orca. And, and, and this is a, a great picture of what uh, a high resolution or, orca image might uh, give us. And as you can see, you get a great plan view. You kind of see this, the lay of the land, what's around. Uh, but it doesn't tell you a whole lot about what that particular image might be or, or what the, the dimensions of that. And that's where these oblique images really come into play because when you bring that oblique perspective in, now it's, it's kind of the way we see the world. And, and as we unfold this conversation, I'll spend a little bit more time explaining why that oblique image uh, really has benefit as we talk about HCAs. So you've got this now, you can see the vertical surfaces, uh, you can clearly see the dimension of it, and uh, with the, the technology that we use, not only do you get that high resolution imagery uh, from the top down view, but now you get it from all four cardinal directions. So you actually have a 360 degree view of that particular feature um, as it, as it uh, resides on the view. So shifting gears, we've, now we've kind of talked a little bit about some imagery, right? So that's kind of the basis of the central thesis of my conversation, that imagery is important as we talk about uh, HCA determination and verification. So uh, that's, that's concept number one. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about what I've seen is kind of the, the standard, more traditional, higher level certainly, uh, points of, of interest when it comes to integrity management and HCA analysis from, a, from an operator's perspective. And this list is by no means exhaustive, and each operator approaches it slightly different. Some have different sensitivities, so they focus in, in greater detail in certain areas. But as you can see from the list, and I'm, I'm not going to read it, uh, but these are the central kinds of things that we're, we're always interested in. They always generally revolve around um, uh, uh, structures, bu building structures, and areas of congregation. And so those are really the the two big areas of, of concern. We want to know what are all the buildings around my pipeline, and then what are the areas where people might show up and, and uh, be exposed by my pipeline. Um, and then the last piece is you know, the, 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 uh, the structures that are four stories or more because those go into a, an immediate class that calls for us to be even uh, more diligent. And I know that many of you know all the, the regs, so we won't, we won't detail too much of that. Uh, going forward. And here's just a, some additional uh, examples uh, if you haven't had enough already. So uh, structures or, or areas that are uh, open air, places of congregation like playgrounds and football stadiums and stuff like that, uh, all the way down to occupied buildings. So that, that's just kind of a, a, a quick lead into what I've seen is, is kind of a common solution in most of the operators that I've, I've talked with and, and believe me, I've talked with uh, uh, many of them, a lot of them in this room have probably already had this conversation with me. Um, so what, what I've seen historically, when, our, when operators are using imagery, generally they're trying to find uh, the lowest cost way out of doing this. And that means usually looking for something that's free. So that could be anything from Google Earth to, uh, to NAEP imagery to stuff that they can get out of uh, Esri. Uh, all of which has uh, a, a variety of GSDs, and, and many of the, the operators that I've talked to generally start at something at very coarse, like a one-foot GSD, trying to do uh, determine what these structures are in there along their right-of-way. Um, but it all revolves around trying to get the, the work done with the least amount of cost. And, and what I'm going to try to share with you today is that that's good, but that may not get you to where you want to be, may not allow you to operate at the, the risk profile that you and your management uh, are trying to get you. So usually what that means is that if you're trying to de then develop um, a class structure file using this kind of data, it becomes very difficult. The, the, the more curse or the more uh, coarse the data is, the more difficult it is to, to actually pinpoint those structures. Um, more, more likely than not, you're not able to really verify when that data was taken, so you really don't know, is that really the way my pipeline works, looks today? If you go on Google Earth, for example, uh, what you'll see is a copyright date. You won't necessarily see a date that the, the images were shot. So you, you, you don't really know. And in many cases, Google does a great job of trying to keep data fresh, but it could be as fresh as you know, three months ago, or it could be three years ago. You'll never know. 
Um, and so that becomes a, a real problem in terms of trying to represent what is on your corridor at that particular time where you're doing your determination work or your verification work. The last thing is that you're, you, if, if you're trying, if you're on this path, then you're generally utilizing very heavily uh, your field uh, your field crews to, to do the, the heavy lifting of that. You're usually uh, asking them to, to walk the pipeline, tell you where the new structures are, or tell you where the changes uh, have gone. And while that's, um, well that, that is a, a very logical use of field crew, I haven't met uh, an operator yet that is really satisfied with that because the first thing that most of them will, will share with you and admit quite frankly is that while the field crews do a, a lot of great work, this is not something that they really want to do. This, this really isn't in their bailiwick and they just do not do it. And so therefore the, the quality of that work is often <coughs> variable. I guess that's a nice way of putting it. Uh, it's, it's variable. It, some of it can be really good and some of it can be not so really good. So, and, and it doesn't really matter how well you train, human condition such that it is, each team or each crew or person is going to take a different interpretation of those requirements or the things that you're asking them to do. And so as a result, those, those reports that come in are, um, are not standard. They have a different take on it. They, it just, they're using a different filter. It's just human nature. So the, the, the issues that we see is that, that uh, low, low resolution imagery really doesn't allow you to, to actually determine occupancy. It's tough to see uh, what's going on, on the ground when you're using really coarse data. Don't smile at me, Joe. Uh, structure points, uh, it, it allows very, it's very difficult to get accurate determination of the building outline using that data. Uh, and then again, we talked a little bit about this field personnel are, are the ones responsible for really generating the changes that go into GIS and, and so therefore that, you know, you've got all that, uh, the issues that go along with that. So what does greater resolution give you? Well, it, it gives you an opportunity to actually perform the kind of work that you need to perform, which is determining what are the, the building structures along your pipeline. And as this, this, I think this example does, does it uh, perfectly well. In, in, uh, in very coarse GSD or, or not so high resolution imagery, it becomes more of a generalized um, outline. When you have very high resolution, you can actually do the, the structure correctly. And, now, and, and the point of that is that the tighter your structure, your, your building outlines are, the, the better your quality of your class file is going to be, the higher, the, uh, the higher quality of the output of, of your uh, integrity management software will be uh, as a result because obviously it's got, it, it, the, the data's better, you're going to be drawing much more um, correct conclusions about how to operate your pi pipeline. So a little bit about why I see uh, the oblique perspective as being an important ingredient in this whole conversation about HCA, HCA determination and verification. Here's a really, uh, uh, just a very uh, short example of why that makes sense because as we're looking and, and just let's just do a little role play here we're, we're trying to figure out what are these buildings that we're going to put into our class structure file and we've got this uh, big ortho image that we're looking at and we're looking at, at straight down at this really large building and then right next to it there's another smaller building well it's of substantial size it's not a shed obviously it's not a you know, uh, you know some sort of tool shed it is some, a, a structure of some, uh, some size so if you didn't have, or if all you have is orthos, you're going to include the structure in, in your class structure file, and then, or at least then send field crews out to verify. Well, here with the uh, oblique image, you can clearly see that it's a tool shed and, and not intended for human occupancy. We don't need to include it in our, in our conversation. And then the, the other thing that it allows you to do is determine uh, the heights of structures so that we can immediately, um, from the data at the desktop, not having to go into the field, make a determination of what structures are class three and class four. If this thing is over four feet, we're obviously at class four, right? So, and again, this gives us an opportunity to do a lot more actual verification work because we now have tilted our image from straight down to the side, and now we can actually determine what those, what those structures really look like. So, we'll talk a little bit more. Um, this is... This is, a, this is an interesting example. I don't, I don't know how germane it is because it, 
you know, honest, honestly, if you were looking at this thing from the ortho view, you'd pretty much get it that it's it's a structure of some importance. You're going to have to deal with it, but it, it does it does make a good point that you know, you'd never see the cross on top of that building without an, an oblique view. So um, this is probably more to the point that with an oblique image you can now see very small details because you're looking at it in a more real real world perspective and you now can see things like the crossbars in a in a in a, in a uh, field that isn't readily apparent that that's probably used for um, episodic gatherings uh, for sporting events so again it's just another case in point why including a different perspective or a different type of imagery high resolution imagery can have an important benefit to um, to building and determining and verifying what is in your class structure. So, and, and if I haven't made that point clear, that this whole notion, all this is about, is just getting the data correct, right? So that when we do run our analytics, that what comes out is actually the right stuff. So you're not working on the wrong section of pipe because you think that it's included in, it's, it's part of a class four when it really isn't because it's outside the boundaries of, of your buffer. Or, and so therefore you're, you're either running at a lower pressure or you're making a, an investment in, in changing the, the structure of the pipeline, all of which that just means money, right? <coughs> and at the same vein, if we, if we haven't got this class structure filed correctly, then your management can't sleep at night. And if your management's not sleeping at night, probably you're not sleeping at night. And then all, we can just all sleep at night if we just <laughs> do this simple thing, right? So. This leads me kind of the, to the, the central thesis here, which is if you don't remember anything else I said, and, and God knows <coughs> how you should, that this is where having a primary data set source and high resolution imagery offers no better way of having a primary data source, allows you then to have a, uh, a defendable position with anybody that challenges why a decision was made because you have the record. Here is what it looked like at this point in time, and therefore this is the decision I made. It is totally defendable. And that's why that, that, that is, is so, so important, and I'll reiterate that. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means that you know when it was taken. You, you have a specific date. This is what existed on this point of the earth at this date. I know exactly what that looked like. It's georeferenced so that we can then, we can also tie it back and say, look, we, we can definitively say that this image isn't floating someplace in, in the ether. It belongs right here. So it is indeed the way my corridor looked at that point in time. And the, and the third point is really, this is the primary piece of data that we're using to make these decisions. So we're not relying on the vagaries of field reports and the filters that, they, that your field crews might be using to give you that data, you have a visual record that is documented, it is dated, it is georeferenced. So I, I probably covered all this, so I won't, I won't uh, spend a lot of time with this, uh, but this is really, at the end of the day, this is the, the whole notion of a primary data source. It gives you that audible record in which to, to defend any decision that you make. More importantly, it allows you to, to really defend yourself for uh, reinforce the decisions that you're making to management so that they understand that yes, we're operating our pipeline, our system at, at the lowest risk possible because we really understand what's, that, what's down. How, how are we doing on time? Oh, good. We're right on time. So, um, I thought I'd, I'd share with you a, um, a case study. And this is a, it's a very simple one, a, a, a very short one. Um, the, uh, the, this case study is Chenier Energy, and for those of you who don't know who Chenier is, uh, Chenier was, came into being 19, or 2005 maybe, 2006, 2007. <coughs> Sole purpose was to import natural, natural gas, because at that time, if you recall, the sky was falling. We were going to run out of natu natural gas, we had to do something, we had to start importing. So Chenier came into being for the sole purpose of doing that. So they built this beautiful terminal in Sabine Path uh, down near, near, near Houston. And they uh, built a very small but well-documented 100-mile pipeline to connect from their terminal to the interstate uh, pipeline system. 
So they were extraordinarily proud of the fact that they had done everything best of breed. And at that time, they really did. They knew where every weld was. They knew all the, they had a complete bill of material. It was brilliant. It w truly was best of breed. But the problem was that the, the, the uh, imagery that they were using in, in, uh, for determining their, the, the, the buildings around the pipeline wasn't, uh, wasn't, uh, was, was basically free stuff. And they were very uncertain whether or not they had captured the data correctly. So what they, they decided to use was our technology to help them reinforce that. And the, the, uh, the result is that this, uh, as one example of determining that a structure that they had as classified as not for human occupancy was indeed a, uh, a multifamily uh, site. So to give you a little bit more color, uh, I was doing this presentation to Chenier. And it, so picture... We're in a, a, a beautiful conference room with all the, the VPs of Chenier. Uh, we're doing a lunch and learn, so you can hear all the rappers and people lunching, and the, you know, they're, they're having their coke, and the, the, the chatter's going on. And I'm doing my little presentation through all this nonsense. And finally, one of the VPs said, well, go to this address. I don't know why. And I'm doing this live you know, demonstration. So I type in this ad address, and up comes this, this building over here, this circle. And so then I start zooming in, and the next thing you know, this oblique image comes up, and the room went absolutely silent. And I didn't know exactly what I did, but I wasn't sure if it was good. <laughs> and so, so I said, okay, what, what, what happened? And they go, we have this as animal bars. I said, well, clearly it's not. And I think the big tip off was, as you, as you rotated around, one, you could see gas meters, and, and two, you could see lots of windows and doors. But I think the big tip off was probably this thing down here. Um, and that is a, a trampoline. And, and, and even in Louisiana, I know that the cows don't use trampolines. So um, that was a, one of the tip offs. So that's, that was just a small example of a company who, by all standards, was using best of breed uh, from start to finish, who still didn't have it quite right. And so they utilized this technology then to really to pump up the volume in terms of improving the quality of their data so that now they had a, a, a very pristine view of the structures along the right of way, the things that change, and um, the, the, uh, going forward. So, <clears throat> enough of the sales pitch, enough of the kind of this, the case study st stuff. This is really about okay, if I've sparked your interest at all, in utilizing high resolution imagery in any part of your HCA process or workflow. What I want you to now take away is, okay, here's some of the things that you need to understand. If you're going to use a vendor, and obviously you're not going to do it yourself, you'll end up hiring somebody to do it. Um, these are some of the things that, that are important to understand and a little bit of some guidance in terms of, of picking someone. So the most of, one, of the, one of the points here is understanding the, the resolution of the imagery that you're going to use. Now, I've, I've kind of made a case uh, uh, as I've gone forward that, that higher resolution imagery is better, right? High resolution imagery, better than low Im imagery. L low resolution imagery, bad. High resolution imagery, good. So what I've seen is, well, what, what GSD works best? Or what is the industry utilizing? Well, for the most part, people in, in the pipeline space, a six inch GSD is of sufficient uh, high resolution for them to do the work that they need to do. Um, they, anything less, and it, and, it's, and it can be somewhat dubious. Anything more, it's really nice and it's great to show your friends and, and you know, the management, but it really isn't going to buy anything uh, in terms of, of functionality when you do the work. So six inches is probably the right balance. And there, there's always a cost <coughs> off, right, between uh, the levels of, of, of uh, resolution. Then the, the next piece is that kind of goes hand in hand with the, the, the width of the corridor. And generally speaking, if you're, if you're using a six inch uh, GSD, you, the width of that corridor, the, when someone flies it for you, will be sufficient to cover your PIR and beyond to some, some level of uh, satisfaction. When you get really high resolution or something below six inch, there's, there's a, a, a good possibility that the swap could get a, a, a too narrow for you so that you're not collecting all the, the structure data that you need to collect. So that's something that you just kind of want to talk through with, with anybody that you're considering having a project with. So, um, 
that leads again to, to the next point of, of uh, um, accuracy. And again, that's one of the things that, as we talk about creating structures, well, we want them to be as, as closely aligned to the center line as possible, right? Because if, if, if we do that, then we're, we're bringing all the right projects in, all the, all the right buildings in, and we're not bringing in too many, we're not bringing in too little. Um, and for that, you need something that's relatively spatially accurate. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be engineering grade. It just has to be reasonably spatially accurate. So what we're recommending is look for somebody that can provide you some data that at least on a horizontal basis is plus or minus three feet. That's going to be plenty accurate for the kind of work that, uh, that we do here. Another thing to consider is the timeline. I mean, you all got work to do, right? So when you finally make a decision that you want to go this route, well, what I've seen is, you know, operators are a little bit like 10-year-olds. It takes them a long time to get around to making a decision. Once they, they make it, they say, are we there yet? What about now? Are we there yet? So getting that data back in your hands so that you can do your work is really one of the, one of the primary things that you want to consider. So you want to look at a vendor that has the capabilities of actually create, uh, collecting the data, processing the data and turning it around within your timeline, not theirs. And then uh, one other point is the ability to deploy that data. How are you going to consume it? Is it just simply that you're going to consume it in your GIS? Or do you need some other tools to be able to utilize it and deploy it through the, uh, throughout the enterprise? So you want to be able to, to have a conversation with your vendor about, OK, what are my deployment options? And I will, the only point that I will make here is if the answer is, I'm going to give you a hard drive, then you should say thank you and go to the next vendor. Ah, we don't need to talk about that. All right, so final points. So let's make sure that we're comparing apples to apples, because each vendor will have a different choice on how they price. Some will price per line mile. Some will price based on a, a structured project. Uh, you know, some will price just based on the phases of the moon, I don't know. But you'll get a, a variety of ways of looking at the data. So let's make sure that we've, we've got all the same um, components in that when you see a price, because not all prices, prices are equal, right? So is there, fa is there fairing charges? Um, in this industry, we're, we're famous for having to charge people to, to fly the plane over to the area, do the work, and then fly the plane back. Uh, which, uh, you know, adds a lot of costs. Is there setup fees associated with it? Are there delivery fees? Are there maintenance fees? Are there deployment fees? Are there any other fees that I'm not aware of? So those are just some to watch out. Just make sure you ask those questions. Um, important here, maybe, maybe silly, but it's important. You need to get some samples, right? Show me the quality of your work. Don't take my word for it. Make me show you something that I've done. So, and with two minutes to spare, these are the points that I really wanted to cover. That Metric Oblique has a place and an effective place in an HCA uh, verification determination conversation. That you need something that is documentable, that is a referenceable piece of data that can be used in a, in a defensive mode, both internally as well as externally. And then the, the, uh, the, the last point is you know, it's, it's, it's a way of, of cost-effectively making determinations about change in and around your, your uh, right-of-way. With that, I think I have just about exhausted time.